Hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar session on expanding your business to the Philippines in the new normal. Our presenters for today are Ms. May Abera, Senior Trade Consultant from Orisa International, and Ms. Amanda Carpo, Country Head of Incorp Global Philippines. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session, so kindly keep sending your questions in the question tab. In case you face audio difficulties during the webinar, please navigate to the audio tab, select computer audio. If it's already selected, please switch to no audio and reselect computer audio again. This will fix the issue. Also, the same link you received upon registering can be used for the entire webinar series. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Ms. May Abera, to begin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon from Manila. Welcome and thank you for joining us in today's webinar. We all, we, I also would like to thank Incorp Global for inviting us to speak today about the Philippines. My name is Amea Brera. I'm a trade consultant with Orisa International. I've been with the company for four years now, and I've been doing partner search projects as well as market research projects, not just here in the Philippines, but also in other key markets here in Southeast Asia. So for today, I will be discussing about doing business here in the Philippines. So I will be providing you a brief um, snapshot about our economy, our key sectors, as well as potential route to market. And after I speak, I will be passing this on to Incorp Global Philippines country head, attorney Amanda Carpo, who will be discussing primarily about establishing presence here. And after uh, we present, we will be happily discussing um, and answering questions that you may have. Okay. So uh, before I begin, just a brief background about Orisa International. We are a market entry consulting firm headquartered in Singapore and with offices throughout Southeast Asia. So we specialize in providing market research for companies looking for information and strategic recommendation on how to enter or exp expand their market in Southeast Asia. We also connect with companies with local partners, such as distributors, end users, or industry contacts. We can also provide a dedicated person for lead generation as needed. We've been helping companies for more than 20 years now, and we've done thousands of projects in every sector, and this helped us to um, acquire unique perspective by seeing what good companies are doing when they internationalize. So these are our offices in, here in the region. We have a team of, of about 30 people, mostly local professionals from each of these countries doing research works and finding and building local contacts. So here are some of our government clients. Um, they're mostly economic development agencies from North America, Europe, and Asia who refer their companies to us. For example, in Singapore, we are the only in-market consultant selected by Enterprise Singapore for all five Southeast Asian countries of Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia. And speaking of Malaysia, we've been appointed as in-market consultant by SME Corp to help Malaysian SMEs grow. Here are some of our corporate clients. So you can see um, the sectors here are a variety. So we've helped companies um, selling everything from apples to aerospace, education, environmental, medical, and many more. So about the Philippines, let me begin by presenting an overview of where to do business here. So uh, first, we're divided into three island groups, Luzon here in the north in green, uh, in the middle, we have Visayas, and down in the south is Mindanao. Um, the capital city is Manila, up here in the north in Luzon. This is also the, uh, the main uh, government and business hub. However, many people are flocking to Manila, resulting to congestion, traffic, and higher operating costs. Thus, the need to decongest Manila arose, leading to the development of other cities that have more space, offer lower operating costs, and still have an abundant talent. So aside Manila, here in the middle in Visayas, the key urban center that has been developed and continually developing is Cebu City. Here in Mindanao is uh, Davao City, and also currently uh, being developed 
is the new Clark uh, City up here in the north, which is located 100 kilometers north of Banela and is positioned to become an alternative government hub, also as the next big business district in the country, and also as a smart and disaster uh, resilient city. Here is a brief economic snapshot of the Philippines. Um, in general, the economy of the Philippines is one of the strongest in Asia, one of the fastest growing in the world, and even with the pandemic, is still forecasted to post a positive growth this year. The size of the country's economy of more than 300 billion is about the size of the economy of Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. Here, um, you can see a pie chart here showing what the Philippine economy is made of. As you can see, uh, the model is different from other countries as we are mainly driven by the services sector. And just in case you are wondering why the services sector is this big, this has something to do with FDI. Despite the growing FDI, we are not yet attracting as much FDI compared to other countries in the region, particular, particularly when it comes to manufacturing. And there are many reasons for this, but for one, uh, this is because of the limit limitations on our foreign investment within the Philippine constitution. Now, with an English speaking and an educated population, young and also the nature of the service industry, which generally requires low capital and minimal equipment, the Philippines has eventually evolved into a service society dominated by the IT business process outsourcing sector or, or ITBPO tourism, and recently, the fastly growing gaming sector. Then there are also the overseas Filipino workers, or OFW, engaged in a variety of jobs abroad and are sending remittances to their families to the Philippines. So just um, update an update about um, what's happening here about the pandemic. So um, recently, we've been recording um, several cases as our country ramps up on testing. We have also transitioned from a total lockdown in mid-March to the recent easing of restrictions called General Community Quarantine or GCQ. And under GCQ, most businesses are currently open except those that promote mass gathering or close contacts such as tourism and cultural activities. So um, if you are a company and you're planning to expand into Asia, the Philippines should be one of your choices. And here are three reasons why. Number one, if you have a product or service to sell, we have a large domestic market here, which presents a wide range of opportunities in various sectors, from retail to transportation and logistics, construction and real estate, healthcare, financing, among others. Number two, if you're looking for an English speaking market with high literacy and digital penetration, yet labor cost is low, the Philippines is the best place to go in the region. And this is why several global companies across a variety of sector have part of their operations done here, such as JP Morgan, Amazon, SAP, and Accenture. Number three, continually improving business environment. So with the current administration, there have been a series of initiatives to address bureaucracy, such as the recent order to eliminate overregulation among government agencies, as well as in digitizing government transactions that are projected to significantly reduce business registration. Also, uh, recently, there are important bills for businesses that are under deliberation. One, there's a bill to get gradually reduce corporate income tax from the current high of 30% to 20%. And number two, we also have um, a bill under review that would allow 100% foreign ownership in public services like transportation, communication, and power. So these are the three reasons why you should consider doing uh, business here in the Philippines. Okay, so let me briefly discuss about trade overview. As you can see here um, in this part of the slide, um, mo, uh, import is much bigger than our export. And this is because as mentioned earlier, the Philippines is a service driven economy with a huge domestic market. market. Thus, this largely explains what you see in this graph. And it is also worth noting that because the Philippines is not mainly an export driven economy, 
Disruptions in the export market, such as the current pandemic, does have a negative impact um, to our country, but it is not as much as compared to export-reliant countries. M meanwhile, here on this side, you will see um, our top imports and exports. And as you can see, uh, electronic products are both um, the leading uh, products that are traded. And um, this includes office equipment, consumer electronics, and semiconductor components and devices. Let me also briefly show you the countries um, which are the top trading uh, partner of the Philippines. So you see here, except for the United States, all of these countries have a free trade agreement with the Philippines, allowing them to have zero or minimal tariffs on imports and exports. And um, even without a free trade agreement uh, with the United States, the US remains a top trading partner owing to decades of strong bilateral relationship with the Philippines. So we now move on to discuss key sector in the Philippines. Okay, so uh, let's discuss first retail and e-commerce. So uh, retail landscape here, it is quite unique in the sense that malls and commercial centers are thriving. For, a, for example, IKEA is set to open its biggest store in the world next year here in Manila. Most are popular here basically because the air conditioning in these commercial establishments provides remedy to hot and humid weather. Mall operators leverage this trend and thus over time, malls in the country have grown larger in space and have evolved into a one-stop shop for errands, not just for groceries and leisure, but also in doing government transactions and holding events such as religious mass gatherings. And also along with a thriving uh, mall culture. E-commerce is fatly growing and is projected to become the biggest component of the internet economy. Notably, the most utilized tool in, in online selling here are social media and online marketplaces, Lazada and Shopee. Social media is an important selling tool because the country is one of the heaviest social media users in the world, with Facebook being the biggest. So marketing and promotions use, using social media is one key channels that businesses should consider here. And moreover, with COVID-19, e-commerce transactions and adoption have accelerated, and the same goes as well for uh, digital payments. So all in all, companies should leverage the country's strong digital culture, with the Philippines being one of the top most internet users in the world, spending around uh, 10 hours per day online. And also in general, even though the market is uh, generally sprite sensitive, but still many Filipinos have an affinity for global brands. For example, Mercedes-Benz and BMW each nearly had 1,000 units of cars sold in 2019, while Starbucks has grown to almost 400 locations in the country. And also another um, uh, one, one top selling um, retail category, FMCG products, uh, just a note, these are generally re relatively easier to sell versus other types of products that require special technical expertise. So appointing distributors and agents for FMCG would be ideal and would also help to solve the challenges in getting products to consumers across the vast archipelago of the country. Uh, next sector uh, is ICT and BPO. So as mentioned in the previous slide, um, e-commerce and the internet economy as a whole are growing fast. However, one key challenge that is limiting not just um, the internet economy, but the whole ICT industry in general, is our internet speed is one of the slowest in the world. However, to address this, the government presently has initiatives to expand our broadband infrastructure the biggest of which is an ultra high speed international undersea cable that, being, that is being built, built by global companies such as Facebook. And hopefully, the, uh, this is set to connect to the Philippines before this year ends and will therefore expand our capacity. Uh, key uh, spenders um, in our ICT sector are one, the outsourcing industry, the government, and normally local large firms, particularly those um, in the telecom industry, 
financial services, retail and manufacturing. So notably with the pandemic's disruptions, also the demand for online learning has jumped and e-learning is to become a major component of the Philippine education system. And also let me uh, briefly discuss uh, the BPO sector, since as mentioned, this is a top spender and one of the key components of the Philippines ICT sector. So our outsourcing industry has evolved into a variety of experts, expertise beyond customer servicing. Now we have digital marketing, legal accounting, financial analysis, supply chain, medical transcription, computer and IT services, and even management consultancy. So for example, Many of the world's biggest financial institutions have a back office operations here for processing of paperwork in investment banking or even fund administration. Meanwhile, cloud company NetSuite and many other IT companies have consultation and technical support here. And they're serving not just, uh, they're serving a wide pool of global clients. And even manufacturing companies have back offices here for supply chain and analysis and monitoring of their operations worldwide. So that is how big it is. Uh, another key trend um, in the outsourcing sector uh, that's very important to note uh, is that automation is the, driving the need to upskill BPO workers into middle and higher value skills, such as content creation, data analytics, and software development. So, this trend is presenting an opportunity for more training and education. And because also of the digital nature of BPO, the sector is a bit upbeat about their fast recovery from the pandemic. So hopefully, I mean, in the next few months, they should be um, able to um, uh, recover at a significant rate. So third um, sector is construction. So um, the Philippines currently is experiencing an infrastructure, infrastructure boom in the transportation, water, and energy sector, the magnitude of which has been unseen since the 1970s. The biggest of this is in transportation covering a construction and improvements in our airports, seaports, railways, roads, and other projects. So just a brief background, businesses have been discouraged by the country's weak infra and heavy utility costs. E-commerce is also challenged by the high cost of logistics. So in Metro Manila, traffic is one of the worst in the world. And imagine uh, during rush hour, if I have to travel, personally, it would take me two hours to travel just a seven kilometer distance by car. So this is how serious the situation here is. However, this is about to change in the next uh, few months or years as the infrastructure boom will not only benefit businesses and ordinary citizens, but will also help combat climate change. Another thing to note of, important uh, to note of in the construction sector um, is that aside from government spending, we have a large domestic market here that's driving, that's driving the need for more houses to be constructed. And another thing is, Aside from uh, the need from uh, Filipinos, there's also the influx of Chinese in the countries, which are driving the demand for condominiums, including the market for, lux for the luxury segment. So these Chinese nationals are working in firms operating the Philippines, which offer online gambling services that they market outside the country. And currently, there's a lot of them, like about uh, 70 Chinese working in the industry, the bulk of which are in Metro Manila, and they are employed for their language skills as they are in charge of communicating to their colleagues overseas who play online games. So um, second to the last sector, manufacturing. So key industries, we have uh, semiconductors, uh, which comprises 60% of Philippine exports. So it's that big. Shipbuilding, so we, uh, it's also big. So we serve the demands for smaller vessels in the domestic market and export large commercial ships to the international market. Our chemical manufacturing industry also has bright uh, prospects as uh, the domestic market is big and this um, requires, uh, entails demand for pharmaceutical, personal care, cleaning substances, and other chemical products. Notably, 
Um, initiatives to attract investment into our manufacturing sector include the infrastructure boom that should address logistical challenges and hopefully lo lower power costs. There's also the expected approval in 2020 of a tax bill that I mentioned earlier uh, that will lower corporate income tax and address uncertainties. And then, as I mentioned also earlier, a series of initiatives to improve ease of doing business and open up the economy to more foreign investment. And um, in terms of, in light also of the COVID-19, so there are key trends happening right now in our manufacturing sector. So first, in terms of inputs, our raw materials, many of the raw materials are, are import dependent from China. So many are now diversifying procurement um, away from China. And the second is because of reduced manpower, just like elsewhere in the world, many are also looking into automation. Okay, so the last sector that I will discuss is um, renewable energy. So there are key, there are key trends that's driving the demand for uh, renewables here. So one, currently our energy source about a quarter, a quarter of our energy source is coming from the Malampaya natural gas field. This is located in the West Philippine Sea. And this is projected to be exhausted within the next four to five years. So currently we are ramping up our source of, I mean, uh, ramping up electricity generation um, since Malampaya will be uh, depleted um, in the next few years. Also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're a vast archipelago of more than like 7,000 islands. So that means there are many islands that are off grid. And because of the load characteristics of most of the islands do not economically justify connection to main grids, these islands are often served by mini grids powered by generators and fueled by imported and expensive diesel and oil. And in fact, some, even some islands do not have electricity at all. So therefore the easiest way to provide electricity to these islands are through renewables, especially solar, which is big here. However, um, despite of the massive opportunity in our, our, in our energy sectors, companies should also note of previous reported challenges in processing of permits, uh, which are complex and lengthy. For example, permits uh, could require um, uh, permits from all levels of government. However, the current push for anti-red tape and simplification of bureaucracies should be able to help address this gradually. Also, um, companies should also take note of um, ensuring that they have a sufficient local manpower or local agency to deal with permits and to structure a realistic timetable and expectations. So this is the last sector. So I'll be moving to about doing business in the Philippines. So here in Asia, as many countries are fastly growing, there are many opportunities there are obviously many opportunities here. However, the market is very diverse in terms of public governance, economic and technological development, as well as in culture. So that means that studying the market, having local contacts, as well as patience and setting expectations are needed for you to understand our markets well, manage risks, and ultimately be successful, especially here in the Philippines. So to expound this, first and foremost, is study with the market before you enter and study it thoroughly. Why? One, your study will help determine if the market is basically the right market for whatever it is that you're in intending to do. Questions to ask, for example, are policies, infrastructure, supply chain, human resources, are this in place? How about cost and risk? How manageable are they? And how is the local market development for your industry? And most importantly, how easy can you obtain this information? Okay, so another uh, thing to consider about doing a study is that it, this will also determine your best route to market. Questions to ask like, um, one, is incorporation your best option? What about setting up a joint venture? Or if you want to start small and test the market, how is the market for co-location or, or outsourcing services? Or are you even looking for ease in distribution? So um, 
For example, uh, earlier this year, our Philippine office has conducted a research on the market for one construction material in the country. Our research found that for this particular product, foreign companies who want to supply to the market normally prefer appointing a local distributor with vast resources, and they let these distributors take care of compliance with various government requirements, navigate, navigate local logistical challenges, and develop mar the market through a nationwide network of stores, dealers, and agents. And the main reason for this have to do with the Philippines being an, an archipelago, which as I have mentioned earlier, which add costs in product distribution. And also another reason is, you know, there's still that, that bureaucracy in, uh, in the industry. So this particular information, you see, help in knowing which is the optimal route to the route to market for that particular product. And lastly, why another thing to consider why doing a study is important is that this will also help in coming up with informed decisions when it comes to business strategy. For example, in the same research of that construction material material that we've done, we found out that the absence of a certain technology in the Philippines explains why a particular Client, a particular subsector of that construction material is rarely used locally. And if there are, they have to be imported, imported and the end users are the trail bla blazers in the industry. So see, uh, information such as this is important in determining which of your product mix is best to position in the market. Or, or if your risk appetite is higher, you can also consider developing the market and positioning your product as a market pioneer or leader by being an early bird and taking investments, and putting up more investments. So aside from a study, another important thing that I would like to emphasize is the business culture here. There are several nuances, but in general, the most important are Filipinos are generally hospitable, probably one of the most hospitable in the world. Local connections are important in making an introduction or if you want to get things done. We, uh, generally, uh, building business relationships are also slow and sometimes do not be shocked if email replies can also be slow as Filipinos prefer face to face interaction and even texting on, and messaging. And lastly, lastly, there is the norm of communicating indirectly, which takes into consideration nonverbal gestures. So um, I'm all, almost I'm ending my presentation here. So just a recap, um, these are our services that we offer. So if you're considering in doing business here, um, this, will be, uh, this, this could be something you want to consider. So for example, if you have concerns, one where in the region is the most suitable for the type of business that you want to do here, or you have questions, which of your products and services is best to position and how to do that, or you simply want to be connected with local contacts, our physical presence here, experience and vast network of contacts in key markets in the region will one, make it easier for you to make a regional level comparison across our diversified markets, and most importantly, help you manage risks in entering into a new market or in expanding your businesses. So I will now pass this on to attorney Amanda Carpo to talk about the next section of the presentation. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you, May, for that very detailed discussion. As you were speaking, I saw many questions coming in, so it's clear that uh, it was very interesting and um, and thanks for that again. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Amanda Carpo. I'm a practicing attorney and the country head of Incorp Philippines. Uh, we've prepared a presentation for you today about investing in the Philippines in the new normal with a focus on digitization. Any discussion on doing business today would be incomplete without digitization as a strategy, whether that refers to enabling technology the enabling technology itself, or a means to pivot your business to meet the world's new challenges. Do you know what Disney, General Motors, HP, Microsoft, Slack, Uber, Airbnb, and Venmo have in common? They were all businesses 
that were formed amid an economic downturn. A downturn can be a good time to start a business as there's less competition for resources and whatever, we ch whatever challenges that we face in the new normal brings new customer needs and addressing customer needs is at the core of any business. Is it a good time to start a business? My answer is yes. Merely following trends of change is not enough. Just like organisms facing the great oxidation event, organizations need to reinvent the way they interact with the changing world. They must recognize when an existing model has run its course and evolve. They must create new innovative processes that take advantage of the most abundant and available resources. They must prepare for future upheavals by developing systems with interchangeable parts, produce faster, scale faster, work faster. They must be building something that will establish a clear existential advantage in order to survive in the new stasis and prosper. Any guesses on what the great oxidation event was? Scientifically speaking, that's when cyanobacteria created free oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere 2.3 billion years ago, and it was the beginning of life on Earth. In the beginning, there was chaos. This global pandemic has wreaked havoc on economies and on our daily lives. Entrepreneurs such as yourselves look at the world and see what needs to be improved and changed. And it is the yearning for a better world that fuels business. And that's why we're discussing this today. So in a McKinsey study uh, shows the first mover advantage. That means that you can gain a competitive edge by being the first to come out of this pandemic to start a business. Companies that move early and decisively in a crisis do best. And the Philippines is a good market for experimenting, for startups, for lower cost labor and operations as well. And as well as being a market with, with a unique demographic advantage as uh, May had discussed earlier. So the four modern technology vectors, obviously, that are involved in digitization are cloud computing, AI, big data, and the Internet of Things, or IoT. Cloud computing refers to the ability to access shared pools of hardware and software resources, networks, servers, data storage through the Internet. This was pioneered by Amazon or Amazon Web Services, and today cloud computing is what enables this webinar. It enables us to work from home. Big data allows us, rather than resorting to sampling inferences on an entire population, you can make it on actual data collected and make real-time inferences on all available data. That is what Netflix allows you to guess what you want to watch next, which brings us to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, a practical definition, is the science of making intelligent machines and programs capable of learning and problem solving in ways that normally require human intelligence. This type of technology is driverless cars, chatbots, Google search are all examples of AI. Um, and the internet of things is the connection of devices, basically machines that are talking to one another over the internet. Now all these technologies are meant to build on one another and converge. And it is something that is that we are realizing that digitization is spurred by COVID-19. So these are some of the growth areas which May has already pointed out um, that, involve, that involve digitization, consumer staples, healthcare, communication services, et cetera. Uh, one thing that was mentioned in particular was the business process outsourcing industry. I have a particular favoritism for this industry because it has spurred a lot of growth in the Philippines. Uh, they have, the BPO industry has predicted that even post-COVID-19, this industry will grow and in, in fact will be a main, um, a main growth area for, for the Philippines. Uh, during, during the pandemic, well, it's ongoing, but uh, during our ECQ, uh, BPOs were allowed to operate. Again, uh, this is the Philippines entering 2020 pre-COVID. We were at a huge advantage in terms of doing business here, uh, which is attributable to conservative and responsible fiscal management, tax reforms, structural reforms, ease of doing business laws, reform in corporate and tax laws, and the build, build, build program of the government, which increased uh, infrastructure spending. Um, 
the government's response to the uh, COVID pandemic has been in the amount of 1.49 trillion pesos or 7.8% of our GDP uh, based on four pillars uh, and emergency support to vulnerable groups, resources to fight COVID-19, fiscal and monetary actions, and an economic re recovery plan, which might be interesting for investors because uh, what the government wants to do now is draw in investors in the Philippines. We have forecasted growth of negative 2 to negative 4.8% decline in GDP growth, although we still see positive numbers there. That is a bit uh, of a sobering figure. Um, and in order to, in order to uh, gain investors in the country, uh, one of the reforms that is being talked about today in Congress, earlier mentioned also by 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 May, was uh, the CREATE law, Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act. Uh, this is the main feature. Essentially, is lowering our tax rate, our corporate tax rate, from 30 to 25 percent starting next month in July 2020. This this is not yet law, but they are discussing it as we speak today. Congress is back in back in back in business um, the plan is to lower it to 20 percent over the next five years and uh, they're also allowing for a net operating loss carry over of from three which is what we have currently to five years um, these are losses that can be credited to future tax payment um, and a new incentives plan that has targeted time bound in, in incentives for investors in countryside businesses to support the Balik Probinsya Bagong Pag-asa program. That means that uh, much of the industry uh, we have is very much concentrated in the national capital region. So government wants people to invest outside. So the incentives are also uh, tied to those uh, investment if you begin a business outside the national capital region in an industry. So it's where you look, the incentives will be based on where you are located and what type of industry that you're in. And uh, it will allow for, uh, this, is all, uh, this is all in the works. Uh, we do have an existing incentives regime. However, the new regime, the incentives regime that's proposed will give two to four years uh, income tax holiday and then a special rate of eight to 10% corporate income tax. And that will be for a specified period. Um, so it's first for two to four years for the income tax holiday, and then on years three and four, a special rate of income tax of eight to 10%, depending again on where the business is located and where, uh, what type of industry uh, the government feels that it would like to promote. Normally these relate to export related industries, but uh, there is a push towards, uh, there's also a push towards uh, e-commerce digitization, new technology. There's also a push for the build, build, build program that's again increasing infrastructure, ben infrastructure spending. In my experience, uh, we have had a lot of clients come in wanting to start businesses in the Philippines that are related to construction. So definitely watch the, the in this week and next week, um, we're going to be hearing uh, whether these changes are happening. Part of the reason for the lowering the corporate income tax is also to help local businesses recover from the effects of the uh, extended quarantine that we had here in the Philippines. We also have structural reforms. Um, so we have uh, economic liberalization bills. We have a House bill uh, reducing foreign equity or allowing 100 percent foreign equity in certain industries that were that are normally reserved for uh, for Filipinos or must have partial uh, Philippine equity uh, as well as ease of credit and regulatory reform to improve the competitiveness of the Philippines we're going to see a lot of this next month and all the way up to June 2021 because they are Congress is working on their budget currently. So, uh, you know, my personal feeling is that digital transformation in the Philippines is the sil silver lining. 
It is the fourth industrial revolution. I think there's a lot where the Philippines uh, can improve, can pivot, can strategize, can begin. This is a good atmosphere for, for startups. Uh, because of our demographics here in the Philippines, we have uh, a good penetration um, with uh, cell phones, internet, a young population, which is also which also contributes to the um, uh, which also contributes to the uh, uh, consu consumers and the people who have jobs. So again, um, there are certain challenges also that also will require attention. These work from home arrangements and uh, telecommuting, which is what we're doing now. We would ra we. This is my first webinar. I think I, I have spoken in public. I'm used to seeing faces. Um, of course, with these with this new technology, there are cybersecurity issues, connectivity issues, and productivity issues that are linked to that are linked to uh, the new way that we have to do business. So again, uh, any digital transformation, basically, this, these are steps that are uh, enumerated by Blake Morgan in his book. The 12 Steps to Digital Transformation from the Customer of the Future. In a nutshell, this refers to a uh, customer focus. You know, companies must must switch from being product focused to being customer focused and provide unique experiences. Companies need to embrace change and champion change, especially digital change, and uniting the digital transformation with a company's larger and long-term goals. So I think you're gonna see somebody, every company must have a strategy that, that has to do with AI. Everybody has to have a strategy that has to do with some form of automation um, today. So COVID has forced our hand. Um, we're, we really need to have more data-driven organizations, automation, adoption of machine learning, and AI. These are just part of the transformation. Uh, if it needed a push, this was it. And I hope that we will emerge from this with business transformation and new businesses. Uh, this is a slide that has to do with uh, the requirements of uh, our Securities Exchange Commission on how to start a business in the Philippines. It's a little bit boring. Um, I'll, I can take you through it or you can look at our website to look at more details on how to incorporate a business in the Philippines, but basically, we submit the documents to the SEC, we go and we, our Securities and Exchange Commission, and then we uh, register you with the Bureau of Internal Revenue and the Social Security System and the PhilHealth, Pug eBig for the benefits, et cetera. So I, I would like to, um, and these are the services that are, do, that are performed by Incorp. Uh, we are all over Asia and Southeast Asia. So if you are starting a company in the Philippines or you would like to expand, we have uh, offices that go for, that, that can provide company formation, corporate compliance, product registration, inform you about tax incentives, handle the immigration for your expat employees, handle recruitment, HR consulting, and payroll. And we have the ability to tap into markets that are um, all over Asia and Southeast Asia with our many uh, partner businesses. And um, with that, I'd, I'd like to end with a thought that most of success in any business is won during preparation. And it is our job to help you prepare for your business. And with that, I'd like to... Uh, open the floor for some questions. Let's proceed with the, uh, with the Q and A uh, so that we can, so that we can uh, hear what you guys have to say. Uh, don't let us, don't let us take all the, uh, don't let us hold the mic for too long. So, Let me look through some of the questions here. Um, uh, so Amanda, um, uh, yes, so Amanda, me, Amanda, go ahead, sorry. 
No, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so uh, maybe May can answer this one. Uh, are there any changes that, because you discussed it in your slides, are there any changes that allow 100% foreign ownership for setting up uh, food and beverage with uh, lower registered capital? With uh, lower uh, registered capital? And is this for foreign ownership? 100% foreign ownership, right? Yes. As what I know, as what I know right now, um, uh, it's still uh, generally it's still um, 1460. Although some industries are open, there are bills to open the, uh, the industry. I mean other industries, but generally, it's, uh, especially with a lower capital, it should still be 1460. What do you think, Amanda? Um, right. So, so one of the big uh, so the restriction on foreign investment here is either uh, by equity or by the capital investment that's necessary for a retail industry. It's 2.5 million. Um, 2.5 million dollars investment to get into any retail, any F and B, any restaurant. That would be the minimum requirement. So that's that's a bit restrictive. However, there are there is house bills uh, currently that are so you have to be big to come in. So that's why I think one of the questions was IKEA coming in. Um, it's the big players that get to come in, and the smaller restaurants, smaller shops are. It's quite restrictive for them. There is a house bill in place. Um, that will that should be discussed in Congress. Uh, that that is meant to lower the requirement to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That is not yet a law, but it is in process. And perhaps now with the uh, with the pandemic, things tend to move along faster here because Philippines is opening its doors uh, to foreign investment and or in order to recover. So uh, it's it, it's it's in the works. Is the answer. Agree, agree. Um, how about this question? Uh, any suggestion for a for growing a strong foreign Asian brand in the Philippines compared to the we Western foreign brands? And are Asian brands popular or influencing in the Philippines in general? May, maybe you want to take this one as well. Uh. Okay. So uh, yeah, yeah. So um, the that. Uh, Yes, uh, Western products here, both from uh, North America, both from Europe, are very popular. But also, so does um, Asian products. So um, there are many, there are many factors about this. So Western, because of uh, Western influence and the perceived uh, uh, perceived quality is high. However, what's prohibiting for more uh, uh, foreign retail brands to uh, for a, a, I mean for to have a big market here. Number one is price. As I mentioned earlier, our market is very price sensitive. However, there is a market with this depending on the product, especially products that have that has a high level of technological um, um, technological um, um, input in it. For example, um, Apple. Apple uh, iPhones are is a premium uh, cell phone for for anywhere in the world, but it's also very popular here. Not only because of the engineering and the technology that went into it, but also because of branding. So um, it depends how you position your product here. Now, as to Asian products, it also depends. Uh, for traditional products, for traditional products that can be um, um, easily uh, sourced here, that would mean that it will be um, uh, uh, very easy to sell, just like coffee, just like a tea. And um, also Korean products are also very popular. So, uh, this one, <laughs> so this one, um, the big draw for Asian products normally it has to be with pricing and also familiarity uh, with the culture. So again, depends with the product and how you will position it. I think I think there's a strong market for Asian brands here. Uh, you know, I I I agree. I think I I think Filipinos Filipinos love to shop. They love foreign brands, uh, yeah. whether that's local or Asian. They love Japanese. They love Korean. They love well, traditionally we love Western Western brands. That that's I'm I'm speaking from I'm speaking from just observation. Um, so there's a question here in general to in, and this is this is a little painful for me to answer. In general, to incorporate a business in the Philippines, how long does it take? What needs to be in place? Like how many directors are needed? What's the minimum investment? Uh, one needs to prepare to register a startup business in products and services. Uh, I would say, uh, in terms of timeline, um, we provide between 65 to 95 working days, so definitely plan ahead. My experience has been 
uh, due to this pandemic that the SEC has acted a little more quickly. Normally, that's the uh, normally the two places where you're going to have difficulty is in the Securities and Exchange Commission. But once you are done with that, everything, el all the other registrations um, follow quickly. So it's between 65 to 95 working days. What needs to be in place? Um, ideally, you need a business address. Uh, you will need at least uh, two directors for for a corporation. And in terms of the minimum investment. Uh, for a domestic market enterprise, the requirement, a domestic market enterprise is one that ha sells products and services here in the Philippines uh, versus an export enterprise where at least 60% is uh, exported abroad. Um, the minimum capital requirement is $200,000. Uh, and, and there is no minimum capital requirement if the business is export oriented so uh, the the requirement can be higher depending if you're if you're let's say a lending company or you're involved in insurance etc which has its own another secondary license but for for a vanilla company plain uh, that, that's not on the foreign inv investment negative list and that's not on the uh, the um, uh, or, or doesn't have any other restriction it would be it would be two hundred thousand you do not need and you need to show that in your audited financial statements at the end of the year. At some point, you will need to report that. It used to be that you used to have you used to have to have the money in the bank uh, to show that you know this is a viable business, etc. It is the company's money. Um, but yes, uh, that it, it, the, the, that's the minimum requirement. Uh, uh, me, I'm going to give this one to you. Um, Chinese companies have a very big appetite to expand their businesses in ASEAN. How is the landscape by Chinese investors in the Philippines? Which are the top three sectors? Which which top which are the top three se sectors in which they invest? Yeah, uh, that is true. So um, uh, there's a big appetite for Chinese investment, not just here in the Philippines, but also the rest of Southeast Asia. So um, here in the Philippines, the top sectors where you will see a lot of Chinese, a big chunk of Chinese investment. Number one is the online gaming sector. As I mentioned, um, there are about um, 70,000 Chinese workers here. So there, there are, I think, about 30 to 50 um, uh, gaming operators here. So uh, there is a growing investment in that area. And number two, the biggest sectors um, where you will see a lot of in Chinese investment here is just like anywhere, anywhere in the world, it's in real estate. So um, foreigners here are not allow, allowed to own a land. So it has to be in the condominiums, those um, high rise buildings. Um, so they've been snatching up not just uh, local, I mean, regular um, condominium developments, but also the market for uh, luxury segment. And another sector that, um, and then the, the third sector, this has to be um, varied as what I have seen. So there are potential big investments in um, our uh, uh, in our construction sector, particularly. So um, our government, um, uh, uh, for example, in financing construction pr projects. Just recently, I think um, there was a water dam projects where there have been um, Chinese investment that went into it. So those three sectors: online gaming, uh, real estate, and construction. Amanda? Yeah. Um, so we have a question here that was given earlier during registration uh, that, I'll, that I'll take here. Um, what are the key challenges for a Hong Kong citizen or Singapore permanent resident when venturing in business in the Philippines? Um, so apart from the normal, uh, apart from the normal risks of any business, uh, I think, I think uh, having having a presence here in the Philippines and and sort of managing the risk of not being present uh, with your business is something that I have uh, I have encountered. Uh, so we've helped start up a lot of businesses. Uh, that's the main thing is uh, managing a remote team. Uh, and other than that, in terms of the uh, legal things that you need to be prepared with, um, if any documents are required, uh, for incorporation purposes or for submitting uh, proposals, etc., those need to be consularized. Uh, I think Hong Kong, you can have it apostilled, 
but in Singapore, it has to be consularized through our embassy. That can be a time, time, uh, time heavy process. Uh, so those are the main considerations for residents. Other than, I mean, currently it's currently um, you're not allowed to come. Currently, our airports are not operating at full at full force. So that would be the first challenge is physical, physically being here in the country. Okay. Um, let me look at some more of these. There's so many questions. Uh, Philippines, and, and this one may might know, the Philippines is the land of opportunities. I would like to know how the oil and gas sector is in the country. Uh, yeah, so thank you for that question. So oil and gas, um, this is a very dynamic sector and it, there's a lot going on because as I've mentioned earlier, about a quarter of our power generation is about to be depleted in less than five years, the Malampaya um, natural gas field, which is located off the coast of Palawan in the West Philippine Sea. So um, right now, um, there's a lot of uh, projects going on to build natural uh, gas facilities so that tankers, ships can come here and still provide natural gas. And uh, also, aside from, uh, also aside from natural gas, petroleum oil, is our uh, biggest source of energy here, of our energy mix. So these are mostly imported. So that's why um, uh, fuel here is quite expensive. And also, as I mentioned earlier, is one of our top exports. And because of this, we're also looking at into other energy mix, like um, um, renewable um, energy. So depending what kind of uh, what kind of uh, business that you would like um, uh, to enter into our energy uh, sector, so there's um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. But as also as I have mentioned and also as Amanda mentioned, navigating our energy sector, um, especially if you would like to enter into actual projects and deal with the, with the government. Um, it's not the easiest compared to uh, countries like Singapore um, in Europe. It's not as straightforward. So uh, we do recommend, um, as also mentioned earlier, to having local contacts to make introduction and also to make processing of permits, paperwork um, faster and easier. Okay. So I have another question here. Uh, what is the main challenge and the reason why regional retail brands not top international brands are entering with a local partner or not indirect? Is it only due to the connection that you may need? Uh, so I, I handled, uh, I, I gave a, a talk about the retail industry, which is why I wanted to answer this. Uh, the, the main challenge is the uh, capitalization requirement, the $2.5 million, which I also mentioned. Uh, there are There is a house bill proposed to lower that. Uh, and, and that really that really is the main challenge. So if a brand wants to come to the Philippines, I think the main thing is to find a local partner. If the retail industry now forces you to find a local partner, if you really want to get in and work and work through them, um, we may see this change in this next Congress. Uh, and that's why the big retail brands are here. So we have uh, Carrefour, Ikea, uh, uh, Uniqlo, coming in here in the Philippines. And, and even then, they have uh, partnered with the large uh, real estate developers here in the Philippines, the malls, uh, in order to get these uh, big brands into the country. So yes, in any business, you need connections. Um, but in, in the Philippines in particular, the, to me, the main restriction is the, uh, the, capital, the high capitalization requirement. Um, and it is a capitalization requirement. It is not. Uh, it's not a fee, but it's. It's sort of like you. You have to be a big brand in order to have those numbers that 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 we're asking. So uh, I think. Um, I think we've we've reached our. Uh, oh, okay. I just got word. We have five minutes more. Um, so I'm going to. I'm going to let some more questions uh come through uh and this is kind of interesting um how is the uh, medical hygiene uh, especially women medical uh, female women medical hygiene sector in the philippines what are the chances for indian or chinese brands to develop their brands in this sector uh i suppose this is feminine product feminine hygiene products is there uh, uh, a market for that in the Philippines. May, maybe, 
maybe you can provide some input. Okay, so uh, first, uh, first thing, uh, feminine hygiene product. Since um, this is a product that touches the skin and you know sensitive uh, sensitive parts, so well, one thing to consider first, one thing to consider is the product registration with our um, FDA. Okay, this one. Number two, um, this has to go uh, uh, because this uh, product segment is very highly competitive. Competition uh, mostly uh, coming from local manufacturers, and these are established manufacturers, and also some regional manufacturers, mainly coming from Thailand, which is a very uh, which is an established market for this. So when I say branding, there's a lot of advertising that goes into into this advertising in our. Um, uh, main channels, um, television, social med media, as mentioned earlier, uh, Facebook. So there's a lot of brand building if it's going to be an Indian or Chinese brand, because currently what's popular here is either locally made or it has to be imported uh, from the West or coming from uh, countries like Thailand, uh, Singapore. But mostly what I see locally is either local, um, locally made or Thailand made. Okay, um, I have another uh, question here. Thank, thanks, May. Um, there's a lot of questions about retail in the Philippines, so I'm. I'm uh, so I, I, May, this is another one for you that uh, you mentioned in the slide that the import of chemicals and lubricants are one of the top five products. Can you elaborate these types? Not only um, import of um, raw materials for chemicals, just like um, all your chemicals, um, you know, uh, petroleum products that are eventually uh, goes into the manufacturing sector uh, because our chemical our chemical industry here are made into several products, not just plastics, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, pharmaceutical industry, um, personal care products, cosmetics, coating, and other uh, chemical products. So when we import, these are, these are mostly on raw materials. So yeah, these are mo mostly on raw materials. Okay. Um, and then we, we have a domestic market the um the end um the end product okay. thank you again um so there's a one last question i'm going to take uh, is the the reduction of the corporate income tax rate to 25 percent is laudable however it is still marginally higher than the rest of asean countries i actually had a slide on this but i didn't include it thailand has an impressive incentive for foreign direct investment from a tax perspective is there any advantage that the philippines has over the rest of asean so uh that's a very good question uh it's the reason why uh they have the create bill that's being discussed in congress today uh, the plan is to reduce it from 25 down to 20 percent in order to compete with our asean neighbors uh so that that's not go to neutralize the uh the tax advantage that Thailand might have. In ter so, in terms of, in terms of that, uh, that they've recognized they've recognized that our tax rate is one of the highest in in the region. In if in fact the the world, uh, our corporate tax rate. So this is again meant for businesses to recover and for foreign direct investment to come in, so that we can be more competitive. Um, May, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, nothing more uh, for that. Um, by the way, I saw a question earlier. Just one more. I will answer this briefly. Um, about okay. the retail. Um, <laughs> yeah, was the retail lifestyle here like after work? Yeah. Um, so um, the the retail uh lifestyle here is very vib vibrant. And yes, after work, people loves to go out and eat, and especially for um the big urban centers. And urbanization here is growing at a rapid rate. Not not just here in Manila, but also outside Manila. And because of urbanization, that requires um more products that uh, provide more conven convenience. So people normally goes out. I mean, after work, they eat out or they take out foods. So anything that make I mean for an urban lifestyle, any products or services that um, provides um, faster, uh, faster consumption and uh, very uh, convenient in terms of availability. availability. So that is um, big here. Okay, so uh, we've got a lot of questions and, and we're, we're very excited about these questions, uh, but we don't have enough time. So if you would like us to answer these questions, our contact details are, are up on the, the slide there. You can email us directly. Um, 
and and we'll, we'll be happy to answer you and happy to answer any questions about doing business in the Philippines and the market here. We want to thank you for your for your time and, and, and for listening to us today about the Philippines. And we thank you for joining us. Uh, tomorrow, we will be exploring Indonesia's market and we hope to see you in the webinar tomorrow. I'd like to thank my colleague, May and Orissa. And I'd like to thank our InCorp team in Singapore who is uh, behind the scenes managing this. Thank you so much and thank you to everybody. Please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day ahead. Bye.